Yeah, uh, I'm here this morning to describe a campaign we, we worked on with my colleagues. And if you look at the schedule, it was named Evil Eyes. But uh, based on our naming convention, I will use uh, Evil Bamboo. But we will see the uh, same threat actor. So we will speak about a campaign that uh, mainly uh, use uh, mobile malware. And uh, I decided to don't speak too much about the malware and don't provide too much uh, assembly or technical stuff on a morning. So I will focus more on how the operator or the attacker uh, compromise the victim. And something really specific when we speak about APT most of the time, the attackers uh, target someone specifically. Uh, the thief or targeted, it's because they want to have access to a specific device, specific target, specific data. In this case, at least for me, the first time I work on a case when they don't really care about the victim, they target people at scale and they target community at scale. They are not looking for Mr. Something, but for a whole community. And it was something new for me. And I will explain you how it works. I will explain you uh, why uh, it's a little bit different than what we work on usually. The agenda. So I will speak about Evil Bamboo, the story, because this threat actor is not new. Uh, it's already documented for a couple of years and is doing his job for a couple of years. We identified three different families that we name bad something. So that's why I name it the bad trilogy. It's mainly about Android malware. But we will see that they also have an iOS malware targeted uh, iPhone, iPad, I, whatever, whatever you want. And yeah, breaking news, I will finish by a conclusion. And I didn't work alone on this topic. I work with two of my colleagues, uh, Callum and Tom, and they are not here today, but I think it's important to, to mention them uh, for, for this presentation. And let's start by Evil Bamboo. So if you look uh, on, on Google and if you want the history of these groups, you can also search for Evil Eye or Poison Carp. Evil Eye is a name mentioned by us in the past and by Lookout, I think. Carbon Carp is a name provided by Citizen Lab. And, uh, and yeah. So the first time we, we heard about this threat actor was in August uh, 2019. But it was a pure technical blog post from uh, Google concerning uh, an iOS zero day and an iOS malware. And they didn't link it to any uh, threat actors. They didn't, they only provide technical detail about the exploit and the malware. But, uh, at Volexity, we are used to deal with this uh, threat actor for a couple of reasons. And when we read the blog post, we say, okay, it's in fact, uh, Evil Bamboo. We have a proof that the malware described here is linked to Evil Bamboo. So we published a first blog post. And like the same week, Citizen Lab also published a blog post about them explaining that they are targeting the Tibetan community. And in our blog post, due to our visibility, we said they are targeting Uyghur community. And a few months after, another blog post from us when we understood finally how the exploit was used and deployed on a targeted device. And we do, we did uh, another blog post about that. And since this date, a couple of blog posts appear showing each time the capability of the attackers, showing that they are working on, uh, they are using Android malware also. Uh, Facebook at this time, Meta today. Uh, also took some actions against this threat actor because uh, these attackers create fake Facebook profile to promote uh, the malicious application. So Meta took down all this web page. And yeah, a couple of, of publications. And the last one from was from August this year by ESET when they described uh, one of uh, the variant I will explain in this presentation, which is a bad, bad signal. So it's a pretty well documented threat actor from a tool set point of view. You have a lot of paper explaining what malware, how it works, the features, the capability, the zero day, etc., etc. So I decided to do the stuff a little bit differently and I will almost ignore all this part. I will simply give you some context about what we name the bad trilogy. We have three Android malware that are used by this redactor today. Bad Bazaar, Bad Signal, Bad Solar. And 
they are all a little bit similar, but they are all a little bit different. It means it's not deployed exactly the same way. On some malware, they create fake website promoting the application, saying, yeah, look, this amazing signal application, way better than the original one. You should uh, use it. Some other doesn't have any dedicated website, or we didn't find the website. Some applications are simply, they take an application, add malicious code, and that's all. They doesn't do anything special. They simply backdoor an existing application and share this application. We will see later how they share it. It's really like a low cost. Take application, add malicious code, send application to the target. But uh, one specific family, bad signal, is pretty interesting because they don't simply backdoor an existing application but they patch an existing application and modify the behavior of the application. So we will see a, a, an example just after about uh, the advantage to, to do that. And if we look at the uh, victimology, from our visibility, they target mainly Uyghur community, Taiwanese community, and Tibetan uh, community. So we can easily uh, guess what kind of attackers is looking for these three uh, specific communities. But yeah, that's uh, that's it. Some difference also, which is a bit confusing, and we don't really understand why they have these three families in parallel, running in parallel. They are really uh, running in parallel. Is some of them use HTTP uh, to connect to the C2 server. Some of them use raw socket. It's even hard for me to understand how they can maintain everything together because it, it's, to be simple, it's a big mess. And they find a way to operate everything. Something common with uh, bad, signa, uh, bad Bazaar and uh, Bad Solar is the malicious code is not embedded in the application. So the application is simply uh, an Android loader. So you have the legitimate application, they add a loader somewhere that has automatically run, and the loader download a class on a C2 server managed by the attacker. There is a couple of advantages for the attackers. First, he can protect the main payload. He can protect and hide the, the main features of the malware, which is an advantage. He can easily update it. You don't have to update the application installed on the target phone. It will be automatically downloaded and installed and deployed. And the other advantage is when you are working on signature, you have less code on the malicious uh, application, the backdoor application, and it's more complicated to do signature when you don't have a lot of code. If I take bad signal, so the attackers take the uh, open source version of signal and patch it. And he had a couple of uh, features and two features are interesting for me. So you have a classical get location and stuff like that. But two features are really interesting from my point of view. I think everybody in the room is using Signal at some point. If you want to have Signal on laptop or desktop, in fact, you install a client, you have a QR code, you take your phone, you scan the QR code, and you have a sync between uh, your phone and your computer. Here, the malware is able to do that silently. It means the attackers install the client on desktop, has a QR code, it silently sends the QR code to the victim, which has this backdoor version installed. The backdoor version says, oh, okay, I've got a QR code, I scan it silently and I link uh, the desktop application managed by the attackers and uh, the version on the phone. So by doing that, they're able to watch discussion and read the signal uh, message from the compromised uh, mobile. Another thing they do, it's less clear why, they can define the proxy server on the compromised device. So you have this capability on signal when you can say, yeah, I want to use this proxy server to connect on signal because, uh, for example, I live in a country where uh, signal is blocked, so I can use a server which is not blocked to communicate. The communication is not in text plane, of course, so uh, you cannot read discussion when you are a proxy, but there is some metadata. So maybe you can, I think you can get the IP address of uh, the mobile and some stuff like that. And I think it's interesting for the attackers to get this metadata and maybe he's able to do something with, with that. 
but that may, mainly the, the two most interesting feature for, for bad signal, at least from, from my point of view. So let's speak about the Android distribution. And something we, we need to understand when we speak about uh, minority and specifically Uyghur and uh, Tibetan community is most of the times they don't use the Google Store because something really stupid, but uh, most of the application does not natively support Uyghur and Tibetan. So they cannot have the application on their own language. So there is a, a huge community that translates the application, repackage the application, and share the application. And most of the time, they use this uh, tweak application just to be able to read the application. So they are really keen to install application from the outside of the store because it's something really common. So, yeah, it's important to have this information and to understand why it works at the end. For Taiwanese, it's a little bit different. And here we can see they use a specific other trick for Taiwanese. They take an application which is very famous in Taiwan with more than 100 million downloads. It's a ch chat application and they crack it. You don't have to pay for it. And they put it on uh, apk.tw, which is a uh, Taiwanese forum that share Android application and mainly cracked application. This post uh, has more than uh, 100,000 views. So I don't know how many people download the application, but I can see how many people read the post. And in fact, this application was backdoored by uh, Evil Bamboo. So for this case, that's how they did deployed. So as you can see, they don't target someone specifically, but they target a community. And for example, the malicious application was not stored on the forum itself because you have some scanner on the forum. So in fact, it's a QR code that points to a Google Doc link, a Google Drive link, or a Microsoft OneDrive link, or a Dropbox link. And the APK is stored on this uh, cloud provider and not on the forum directly. Another way to uh, to share the application is to create a dedicated website. Bad Bazaar was deployed on this website. So that's a website that uh, share all the tweak version of WhatsApp. So if you, I'm not sure you can, you can read it, but you have a, like a FWAD WhatsApp, GB WhatsApp. So it's fork of WhatsApp. It's a tweak version. For example, on WhatsApp, you can only have one phone number. Some of the application, they took WhatsApp patch it to have two phone numbers. But it's not malicious. It's simply the tweak community decided to patch an existing application. The threat actor took all these tweak versions that are kind of famous on some part of the world and add the malicious code inside of this tweak application. And you have almost all the most well-known tweak WhatsApp application here, and they are all backdoor with Bad Bazaar. Another example, when they create their own application, they create a dedicated website, but Signal was shared on Signal Plus. So same thing, they said to you, ah, it's Signal, but in better. And Flygram uh, was the same thing for Telegram. So is it take the Telegram uh, source code, tweak it, patch it, and repackage it and share it on this website. So here is dedicated website. It's not something really new. Uh, it's pretty common to create dedicated website to share uh, malicious APK. Something a little bit uh, surprising for me is they created a lot of social media account and they share uh, the application or promote the application on this social uh, network. I put some screenshots. So you've got Reddit. If you don't recognize it, you have uh, Twitter, you have Instagram, uh, I put another Reddit, I think, and you have YouTube. They do YouTube video about their application, showing how the application is good, and to give some, to, to make the application legit, because if you have a lot of stuff, video, and people saying it's a good application, look, etc., etc., people are probably more keen to install it, because it's not something alone, uh, but, but something big. And they create a couple of accounts. For example, on Reddit, they have an account. They say, look at this new uh, WhatsApp version with this amazing feature. Another account say, yes, it's amazing. But this second account will also publish, oh, look, this hiking application 
which is also a backdoor. And the first one will say, oh, it's an amazing application. So they reply to themselves with the Reddit account, always to promote and, uh, and now uh, try to make everything looks legit and, uh, and interesting for, for the user. Another thing they do massively is Telegram. So, there is two kinds of Telegram channels. Some Telegram channel was created by the threat actor himself. So he created a Telegram uh, channel. And for example, one of the Telegram is Alpine Quest. So in this case, it's a, a trail application, hiking application. And how it works, they take the application and they translate it on a couple of languages that are not supported natively by the application, like Uyghur, Tibetan, but it will be too obvious to only keep these two translations. So they had French, Russian, and they had a couple of other translations. And if you want this application in one of these languages, you can download it on this Telegram group. If I remember correctly, this Telegram group has more than 2,000 users. So 2,000 people are receiving notification each time a new version is released and can update the malicious application. And something interesting for this specific group is the, the attackers doesn't even have to share the application because a couple of users from the group really like the application and share it to their friend. So we know that a couple of users share the backdoor application to other friends and it propagates like that. The attacker doesn't have to do anything anymore. The second one is a Tibet phone, which is, uh, it was created by the attackers also. And Tibet phone, uh, shared a lot of APK. Most of the time, Tibetan related APK, such as an application for, for, uh, a calendar of a Tibetan event or an application for, for prayer and et cetera, et cetera. So it most of the time dedicated, but sometimes you have some game and some other stuff. All of the APK are backdoored by the attackers. And last time I checked, it's, 250 APK. So it's, it's really a lot of application and they put application each week on uh, the Telegram, a new, a new one. And they also use legitimate channel that they don't manage themselves. So how it works, they put a malicious application here on one of the channels they manage and they go on legitimate uh, Telegram uh, channel such as uh, Tibet Independent State or the second one uh, is um, a, a channel that is here to help users and everything is in the Uyghur, it's Uyghur language. So on these two channels, sometimes they take one of these links and share it here. So sometimes when you have a discussion like uh, in Tibetan, someone say, yeah, I'm going to be in this place. I want to be some hiking, blah, blah, blah. The threat actor will share a hiking application he backed up previously and shared on one of the previous channels. Say, yeah, you should use this application. It's really good, uh, etc." So that's how we interact with users to uh, motivate them to install application. So it, it was something really new for me when you have so many channels and I probably miss a lot of channels because it's not easy to search on Telegram. And they create community. Some community are here for years, like three, four years. They manage it and they make it living and they share stuff, extra, extra. So I have no idea how many of these users really installed the application, but even if it's a small number, it's, it's still a lot of, uh, of users. Another thing they do is uh, they create fake websites. And for example, Pema Yangland, which is uh, one of the attackers, it's uh, an account that he uses a lot to share malicious application. Sometimes he publish uh, a link like that. So you have a picture with a link to uh, ignitetibet.net. And Ignite Tibet is a, a website created by the attackers. It, it's a malicious website. And if you look at the JavaScript, which is executed uh, when you visit the website, you can see something uh, interesting. First, it really looks like a media website. It's not, uh, it's not too shitty, I would say. It's pretty nice. And if you look at the JavaScript, in fact, it's Gmask, which is um, 
a profiler JavaScript. So when you visit the website, the attackers has your time zone, language, screen resolution. Ethereum, it doesn't really care. It's just Gmask is an open source framework, and on the framework you have Ethereum. But in this case, it's not relevant. And it's also able to do uh, fingerprint based on, uh, on on some browser techniques. So in this case, the attacker is able to to make a, a really good fingerprint of the people that are navigating on the news website. If we look at the server, we can see there is two services running, and based on uh, what we saw in 2020 and how the zero day was deployed in 2020, we think that on the port uh, 9001, uh, you have something which is named Iron Squirrel, which is uh, another open source framework used to protect exploit. And we think that the fingerprint I mentioned just before is used to fingerprint your, uh, your phone and deliver an exploit if it match some criteria uh, defined by the operator. I spent a lot of time trying to get something and it didn't work. But uh, yeah, if it's on specific location around the world, it's hard to be on this specific location. And I try a lot of tricks, but I didn't receive anything. So it could be they don't have anything right now, or it could be my fingerprint doesn't match what they expect and I don't receive anything. And Iron Squirrel was mentioned by us in 2020, but was also mentioned by Citizen Land in 2019. I took Ignite Tibet as an example, but Tibet One and Uyghur Info are two other websites uh, that work the same way. So everybody is waiting for this part of the presentation because iOS is very really sexy, and you will be disappointed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we don't have an iOS implant. But we have a couple, a couple of clues that show that they have iOS support. The first thing is if you go on Flygram, which was a bad signal malware I mentioned previously, a fake Telegram application. And if you go on archive.org, you can see at some point you have an Apple uh, icon here. So that means, yeah, they probably have something linked to, to iOS. But I agree it's not enough to say they have an iOS implant. But in fact, on bad signal, the attackers forget to remove the help of the REST API. So simply by putting help on the URL, I'm able to have all the endpoints. And here you can see that one of the endpoints is slash API slash iOS upload file. If I look on the Android malware I work on, the path was API slash upload file. So we guess there is an iOS uh, support on, on something. Another proof is if I look at Telegram and always if I look at Pema, the account I mentioned previously, I can see at some point he published a link to an application named Tibet One. And if you remember correctly here, tibetone.org. And this application was removed by Google a few days after it was released. So, uh, not Google, Apple, sorry. So it means that there is probably something wrong with the application. So at some point, I think the operators, the attackers, share, directly use the Apple Store to uh, to share malicious application. I, I don't have the application. I simply I can simply look at the screenshot at this time. And if you look at the screenshot, the application is able to show you the weather where you are. So I assume the attacker is able to get your location because to have the weather, you need the location and stuff like that. I don't have it, so I cannot say for sure how it works. But yeah, we are quite sure that the attacker has an iOS implant at some point. It's a, sh a schema about everything, every link and website and everything. I won't spend too much time on it. We have a blog post. You can go on the Volix City blog post if you want to see the details. But to conclude, we have a threat actor which is still active. So we released our blog post a few days ago. Since the release, it didn't share any new malicious application. So we have a fan. And something really specific is, is building communities, which is uncommon for me at least. Maybe some of you are used to, to that, but, uh, for crimeware, I assume communities and sharing and compromising a maximum of device could make sense. But for APT, it's something that is less common. 
at least it targets three of the f what the Chinese Communist Party named the five poison, which is Tibetan, Uyghur, Taiwanese. We didn't have any proof of the two other one, which is a, a, a political party in China, but I guess we don't have any visibility because it's really inside the country. And the fifth one is... A, a, Uh, religious uh, groups, which is also located inside China, so it's probably hard to have visibility on that. If they use uh, Chinese social media, I'm not really used to this kind of platform, etc. So maybe, but I don't have any proof. They have an Android malware, a couple of them, and uh, they potentially have an iOS uh, malware also, uh, or they used to have an iOS malware. They create fake websites with uh, JavaScript profiling, which means they are looking for specific device to deliver something else because it doesn't make any sense to make some profiling for nothing. Or maybe they do statistics to develop something else later or statistics to say, okay, I need this kind of exploit for this kind of phone because statistically I will be have, I will have a big impact to my, uh, against the community. I don't know, but they are doing it for sure. And 28 minutes. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Question. Uh, so clearly I could deduce this from, actually everyone could probably here could deduce this from the poten um, actual, not potential, but the one you detected, uh, the target list. But do you have any um, reasonable suspicion or perhaps confidence in attribution? I mean, who is behind? <laughs> Yeah, for, for, for attribution, not only us, but if you ask to Citizen Lab, if you ask to uh, look out, we publish report, it's all about China. Who, which organization in China, I don't know. Anything specific? Nothing specific. Hey. Yep. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Paul, for this uh, very instructive talk. And um, so just guessing from looking at your slides, so the build websites, the managed communities, they seem to have content managers. They seem to have iOS and Android developers, etc., etc. Do we have any insight of what scale of operation we're talking about? Can you make an educated guess of how many people could be involved in kind of like caring? Because this seems like to me as a corporate-like or almost corporate-like structure nurturing over time, you know, these communities and spreading. I, I saw in one of your, I would say, slides, even somebody looking for help for translating an application, and the threat actor providing a translated application out yeah. of their, well, yeah. well, good heart. Yeah, so it's always a tricky question because uh, it's, it's purely, I can guess, make some assumption and, and nothing else. For the backdoor point of view, I don't think it's really expensive uh, in terms of resources because it's a patch legitimate application, so it, I think it's a batch. So download the application from Google Store, it's patch, it's push. It's easy. For that signal, which is uh, they take application and tweak it to work differently, it's, it's much more work, but you still have the source code. So I don't think it's crazy expensive. And uh, and I don't know. It's big, but I'm not so sure. It's they need like hundred of people to operate because uh, they don't speak so often. Most of the time, when they push an application, it's just one sentence. It's not like a, a whole text. Except Alpine Quest, where you have a lot of blah blah. I don't know why for this one specifically they make a lot of blah blah. But that. I really think everything is can be automated, and uh, you have automation for a lot of stuff, at least for the technical point of view. And uh, I don't really know. The translation in French, because I can speak about the translation in French, is pretty accurate. It's not like Google Translate. So uh, at least they have capability to write on specific language. And I think uh, Tibetan or Uyghur, it's not something uh, easy to find. You need to find someone that speaks language. So they have language capability for sure, but it's hard to say if it's a lot or not. But but it works. It's efficient and for years. So. Yeah. Thank you, Paul, for the presentation. Um, I have a question because you, you mentioned actually that uh, the phenomena to target wide range of uh, people is quite new. But uh, as a reminder, uh, I would uh, like to, to uh, remind in 2009, 2012, 
there was the elder elder elderwood actually a threat actor that was already also uh, targeting Uyghurs, Tibetans, Taiwanese, Hong Kongese, etc. They used for sure different uh, techniques, water holding, and also malwares, but it was a wide infection to target communities. Did you see any links between Elderwood and actually Visco? Thank yeah, uh, we checked, and from the infrastructure point of view, I didn't find anything. From a malware point of view, I didn't find any code sharing. For sure, the, t the victimology looks the same, same profile, but uh, if it's the same guy, they rebuild everything from scratch, or maybe the people that pay change provider, so same victim, but a new provider, and this is new tool set, it's, it's hard to say. But I don't have any link and serious link. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah.